Welcome to Creative. This continues the interview with Tony Kunter. Um, it, it looks as if there's even going to be another episode. So this is a not only is it a first for somebody to do more than one episode, almost back to back, but there's going to be another one to follow. Um, there was such a lot of interesting information that Tony shared about the music business and g getting gigs and all the rest of it that... Um, I just thought we'll keep as much of this as we can. So this one follows on, obviously, from episode one. And Tony's got up to the, you know, I don't know, around about 19, probably not even the 19, mid-1970s. Um, uh, so he's talking about jazz education, really. Um, this is where we join the interview. All right, so, uh, yes, enjoy, enjoy listening. Years ago, um, when I was living in Hastings, I went up to London and um, for a week, a week or so. It was very, very good, and in a way, it was brilliant. Having said that, they'd, okay, they had some jazz tunes, Charlie Parker, fairly simple ones, bluesy ones, and so on. But one of the first things that they did, so they tell you what the chords were, and they give you a sheet with all the chords. I'm um, sorry, the scales yes. from those chords. And when I think about it now. Yeah. I'm thinking it makes sense that's back to front yeah. to be teaching people what the scale pattern even though that's very useful because yeah. the first thing I think is to learn the melody yeah. and in fact when I think about the history of jazz like you're saying with Louis Armstrong because that's totally true that yeah. that trumpet player I played with in that band yeah. was like that sort of approach yeah. really yeah. Yeah. and um, but with the tradition of jazz when it sort of advanced a bit they were using very often pop tunes which they did added chords to and so on so therefore it was a song <laughs> it was song based music yeah, yeah, yeah. melodic music yeah. and then obviously people were trying to do experimental stuff with it and from that it ended up you know you got bebop and and things where people were what would you call it delving more into the harmonic stuff of it and doing something creative with it but in a way it's a bit like if you're going to learn any art form learn the basics first blah, 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 blah. and that like i say that course thinking about it now yeah although they didn't probably didn't realize that's what they're doing it's it was back to front yes I, 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 do you know what i think that is time i think the problem is would you would you organize you know, a course, and you're writing out what you're going to do on the course. It be, you get into the, the academic trap, which is, you know, a great teacher doesn't have to have a lesson plan, let alone a course syllabus. Mm. But you can't sell very much by going, well, we'll just turn up and I'll just give a couple of ideas and just get on with it, yeah. right? Which is really, basically, as a great good teacher, that's what you do. But you can't write that out as a lesson plan. So you end up with what you, what happened there. You go on the course and they've written the scales out because yeah. you go, well, there's your course notes, mm -hmm. you know, and that sort of thinking, it can be put down on paper. But of course, any art form has that problem. You know, mm. any great artist or whatever, when, and again, you know, when I've done a lot of sort of NLP work with, with artists, and you, are, you ask them, how they do something they don't actually know you know the first thing they go is like um, you know you say how do you do that and they go well, uh, I don't know. and they start searching because it's it's obviously in there but they're not it's not in their intellectual mind it's in yeah. the unconscious you know yeah. and you realize that oh and then the next thing that they say is something really weird you know it's not not logical or whatever but it's the way that they connect with how their unconscious works and um, I've got a really, talking about jazz, great story that I heard from a guy called Ray Newton, who was a jazz pianist, who worked 
in, you know, in, in New York. And, um, but I met him in Yorkshire, and he was friends with another guy who was a soft machine. I, mm -hmm. but I met him in, in Yorkshire, and he was, he was a goat farmer at this point, in a place called Goatland in, 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 in Yorkshire. And um, every Easter we used to go egg rolling. So, I mean, it's the most unlikely combination of, um, uh, of characters. But anyway, take the kids up there, and it was his, hat, his place was on the hill, and you know, you go up your eggs down there, whatever. But anyway, and he used to tell these little stories about working with people like uh, Art Tatum, mm -hmm. right? And uh, he said, because, you know, if you were doing a gig as a warm up act for Art Tatum, you didn't go home. You just yeah. hung around, you know, and after hours, everybody was still there. And, you know, Tatum would be sitting at the piano playing something. And he said, one day, he said, I'm sitting there and Tatum's doing some amazing stuff, you know. And he said, hey man, what's that you do? Meaning, you know, what's that scale? And he said, uh, when I feel like it, I sort of do this. <laughs> <laughs> and that was his instruction to this guy about what. Yeah, what I feel like, I sort of do this. So, and you sort of come up, well, that's the secret of how you play. And it's that type of yeah. thinking, you know. Uh, anyway, so let's get to this. So you got your plane with this covered massive amounts of brilliant stuff that you come out with. Um, so what happens? What, 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 what's the first band, what, you know, you start working with, you know, playing? Okay. Well, so when I was at school, <laughs> when I was at school um, with my brother, like I said, we did bits of music at home mm. when I was like 10, 11, that sort of age. Mm. And I was playing drums. And then uh, I started playing bass because I really wanted to play the guitar. Right. But I didn't want to do the same as my brother. It was yeah, just yeah, 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 yeah. stupid nonsense, you know. Yeah. Um, it's brother stuff. It's yeah. And then I started playing guitar. But uh, we had a little band, or a duo actually. Yeah. Uh, I was probably about would have been 12 or something like that. My brother was maybe 14, 14, 15. And with the use of a tape recorder, somehow we made some little backing tracks of the, what do we do now, drums and a guitar. Mm. And then we went and did a couple of gigs, <laughs> literally a couple of gigs. <laughs> At a, uh, in Wigan, which was, we used to live in Warrington near Manchester, and we, yeah. went, we had this club that the, um, the drummer that I had drum lessons from, he used to play in this kind of working men's club oh, right, yeah, in yeah. Wigan, yeah, yeah. and he got us a support gig. Wow. <laughs> My brother and myself, just a duo with a backing on the tape, so we had the, you know, the drums and... Uh, well, that's and incredibly the futuristic if you think about it now, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah. And we did it, I remember we sort of did a couple of gigs like that, you know, from playing there um, and that was the first sort of outing mm. performance wise in that sort of vein and then a bit later when we went at, at another school we were both at this other school in Epsom and then I was doing the classical one thing or another but we had a, formed a little band and fair enough the music department allowed us to practice in the music rooms we used to have some friction with them sometimes. <laughs> An example, I remember time, there was two different floors, I think. We were on the upstairs one with our little band, guitar, bass and drums. <laughs> I was playing bass then. A friend of mine that used to play guitar that I was talking about, he played drums, my brother was playing guitar and singing. And uh, we used to play in the upstairs bit on a Saturday morning or afternoon or something. <laughs> I remember one time there was a clunk clunk on yeah. the door. One of the music teachers from downstairs. from downstairs, he had a choir practice, oh, and he, he was, one of the things that struck me about that as an aside point, was he was so convinced how much, much more important oh, is yeah. choir practice with classical stuff. And I remember it always struck me then, because I'd always loved all kinds of different music, and to me, I just, even now, I lump everything together as music. Yeah. They've got different styles, fair yeah. enough, but... You know, like some people have said to me, oh, are you a jazz player? Yeah. I said, well, no, no. I said, I'm a musician. Yeah, yeah, I might yeah. play some jazzy things or do this, that, and the other. But I always think of everything as yeah. music, you know, not yeah. compartmentally. Yeah. But anyway, I was sort of kind of like quietly incensed by this teacher, 
you know, trying to elevate yes. the importance of what he was doing, however important it was, and belittling what we were doing because we were playing Hendrix and Cream and things like that, which to me was just as important, yeah, yeah. and I still think is just as important yeah. and valid in its own way. And so we were doing that. We had a little school band doing stuff, and that was my uh, that was one step up, as it were, from the duo I had with my brother before mm -hmm. that. And uh, I'm trying to think, we did might have done a gig sort of at the school or something mm -hmm. like that. There was another school band at the time that were very very good. They were playing some John Mayall stuff, wow. and there was a guy mm -hmm. playing uh, guitar. He was very good. <laughs> I remember like. He used the gear he had, I thought, you know, obviously, in the, even though I was playing bass, I was like really interested in guitar. And um, they used to play some, a uh, couple of classics in their set, off that, the B, what they call the Beano album. Yeah, yeah, know, yeah, I yeah. forgot which one it was, but anyway, it was a couple of oh, things. Yeah. And they used to play one called The Supernatural, which I think... Oh, yeah, that's Peter Cruz. Yeah, yeah, they used yeah. to play one, one of those, I was like, oh, wow. And the, yeah. the guy, I remember thinking, he had a Selma amp, yeah, and he had really. a Hofner very thin. Yeah, yeah. Which that's was amazing. Like... <laughs> Cause it's funny because I had a friend who had a, a Hofner really? very yeah. thin. And I had a silver right. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. 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 And I was like, you know, at that sort of time, yeah. you're so excited about yeah. everything. It was like, I would see an amp and it was like, wow. You know, yeah, so yeah, my yeah. Yeah. Anyway. So, my, you know, you'd get some other people at, the, at that school playing, and playing really well, mm. what I thought was really well, a lot better than me <laughs> at the time. And um, so then, yeah, so then when I left school, I left that school a bit earlier than I should have done, because I was a bit rebellious, and I would have been 15, just going on 16, and then normally you'd stay till you're 18, and I didn't. My brother, left, when he left, I left at the same time and ended up going to Hastings College of Further Education, okay. which was to me a lot more exciting because being at a public school, there was a lot of restrictions in many, many different ways. And then they left you sort of to your own devices at Hastings College, which in some ways was a good thing for me. In another way, it wasn't a good thing <laughs> because they didn't have somebody saying, you have to do your homework, or, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. And we used to end up sometimes in what they call study periods, We'd, a bunch of us were more bohemian, would go down, I think Nick Murrell was one. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Your friend, Nick Murrell, and my friend. We, we, a bunch of us used to go down on the beach, you know, and, and, and then there was a friend of mine that used to play drums at that time. He was English, actually, but he'd lived in Miami for a long time. He used to go back there in the holidays. So he had an American accent, he was more or less American. But he had a lovely Ludwig kit. Mm -hmm. And um, we used to just go into the library and study periods, lark about, talk about music, be joking and all that. So I was like well into that. Mm -hmm. And around that sort of time, my brother and I advertised to kind of form a band down in Hastings there. And we had a little band with it. We've got a drummer and a bass player. By that time I was playing guitar. And um, that's right, at first it was like, I was playing guitar at a bass and drum, my brother was just singing. Then later he started playing keyboards with it. And we used to do local gigs around Hastings. And then we, what happened then? We, we got aware of some other bands locally that were pretty good doing the local gigs, you know, youth clubs, what they call youth clubs at the time and all of that. And then, <laughs> I remember my brother and I thought, God, that drummer's really good, you know, and there was things were happening with our band. The bass player wasn't really a bass player, a lovely guy, but it was somebody else had told him, taught him how to play the bass. In fact, the drummer that we got from this other band, mm. it transpired, he taught this guy to play bass. Yeah. So we wanted to get a, a go to a better standard, really, and we poached. <laughs> the drummer from another band and what happened with the bass oh yeah and then uh, bass for, from a, another band as well and that would have been showing my age here um, about 1969 1970 and we formed this band which 
was, I suppose you could call it, my first proper band, um, where we used to do gigs and ended up going to Germany and yeah. all over the place, and making some waves. Not enough waves, because we never got signed, but we used to support those next few years, um, lots of the top bands from the time, like 10 CC and blah, 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 blah. Right. So what was the band called? Factory. Oh. Right. Factory. Yeah, right. And in fact, with that band, uh, about three or four years ago, we recorded an album. We reformed right. to record an album, which we would have liked to have done back in the day, using tunes yeah. that we'd written then. Yeah, yeah. And we did this album. We've actually just done our second album wow. recently, which is sort of to be released soon. Cool. Something you never think that long no. that length of time no. afterwards. And um, but yeah, like I say, that you know, off we went really. Um, I at that time I'd done college uh, and so on, and thought about going to university. But it was a bit like we. By that time, we had this. We we're getting this band together, and it was a choice: go to uni and then miss out doing this yeah, band. Yeah, yeah. And, and I knew where my heart lay. Yeah. It was in that band yeah. and doing gigs here and there and everywhere for no money. <laughs> but yeah, that's to be honest. <laughs> but but to be honest, like the motivation, the money side of it was the last thing we thought of. Mm. We just wanted to make music and, and play gigs and all yeah. that, you know. And, yeah, totally. and that was a great time. Yeah. A great time for music in many ways. And you had things like, you know, you had the Hendrixes, you had these kind of crossover bands, like you mentioned Soft Machine and, yeah. you know, like... Uh, it was a good, it was an amazing time, wasn't it, really? Yeah. Really. And then you had the prog rock and all of that, Genesis, yeah. we used got influenced by that. It was some, yeah, it was a great time for music, I think, in retrospect. Mm -hmm. Very kind of open to all kinds of things. I remember going to, to for example, a festival. Mm -hmm. The first kind of festival I went to, which was the Reading Festival, but at that particular year, 1969, it was, they couldn't hold it there for some reason, so it was held in Plumpton, down in Sussex. Oh, right, yeah, it's quite near where I am. Yeah, 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 down there. And, um, the array of different styles they had there was fantastic. I mean, they had this singer playing with Yes, the first version of Yes, John Hendrix. Yes. Did a spot with them. Yes. They had, um, John Sermons yeah. and people like that, Keith Hartley, bluesy things. Yeah, um, they had folk, they had all kinds of stuff. Chicken shack, you know. Yeah, chicken shack, yeah. Yeah, but the, 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 the different, at that festival, I remember thinking, well, I don't know if I did think of it like that. And they had the who, you know, the different styles of music mm. they had there was mm. like, and everybody seemed to be open yeah. to listening to, to turn, stuff as music. Yeah. In, and it wasn't like, oh, it's a blues festival. It's got to be all blues. Oh, it's a rock festival. Oh, it's a jazz. There was just every, anything. Mm. The only, it, it wasn't classical, but from what I remember, it wasn't particularly, but... Anything else, world music, you know, folk, you name it, was sort of in there, and it was like I was sixteen or something then, and it was like, wow, you know, this, you know, one minute it's like John Sermon, then it's the Who, you know, it's like, wow, mm -hmm. fantastic. Mm -hmm. So I think that time was very good for that mm -hmm. of the inclusiveness of musical styles and maybe not with older people, I don't know, but younger people certainly would just seem to be just willing to listen to anything, <laughs> which I thought was very healthy. I don't know if it's not like that now. So much I think it's sort of, it, yeah, I think it goes through phases, actually. You know, because mm. teaching kids, they've got, you'll get a sort of period of time where they don't seem to be listening to anything. Mm. And then you'll get to, to another point in time where they seem to be listening to absolutely everything. So I've never quite worked out what the stimulus is for that. But, you know, you've got kids that are listening to sort of old rock stuff, you know. Um, and they're also listening to sort of modern stuff. Mm. And, and other, other kids, you know, depending on what their parents are listening to as well, they might be listening to a bit of classical, yeah. you know. And it's like a real mishmash. Yeah. So it, I think it's... It varies... And it's also to do with what's happening at the time, mm. yeah. whether it's, um, whether it, and it could be something like a film comes out and they're using a lot of old music, you know, mm. and uh, certainly was it the Guardians of the Galaxy that sort of, <laughs> re there was a resurgence of 
lots of very unusual stuff from the past. Not necessarily, you know, famous mm. bands, but not necessarily the songs that you would have remembered the bands by, yeah. type of thing. Uh, I remember there was a, like a Redbone number. Redbone? Yeah, you like know, them. so you start looking yeah. and you're like, well, that's interesting, oh, yeah. you know. But, um, good band then. Yeah, yeah, brilliant <laughs> band, yeah. Yeah, excellent stuff. Yeah. So what, what um, you know, what sort of stuff, I'm just giving more on the time here, you know. yeah. um, what sort of, what sort of things did you do then, as this little sort of potted thing, you, you know, you do a lot of, keep supporting other big name bands, that yeah. was an interesting period. It was, it was, yeah, um, it was really, and we were, like I say, creating some waves, getting a lot of interest, it was a great live band, and we did used to blow some of the bands off yeah, the yeah. stage, we yeah. did, um, because it was just we had a very lively stage act mm. and some very good bands really, say pop bands of the time, they just played the, the, the hits off the thing and not much performance yeah. and it was just like we were a very different band. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, um, and I think, and, and potentially a good band, like I say, we never got signed which was quite frustrating. Mm. but. Um, so we did that went on for probably five years something like that and then I think we we used to go to Europe we did blah 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 we did bits of recording demos like we did one at Roger Daltrey's studio he had a studio out in Burwash and somebody from college had been a babysitter or something like that then yeah. and through that he had he built a home studio <laughs> I mean, he had built a home studio and was um, wanted to use a guinea pig for it. So this person got us uh, an in to be the guinea pig. Right. So we sort of recorded down at, at Roger Daltrey's studio, and they had this guy John Jansen, who had uh, been an engineer on Hendrix's stuff, right. on all of that, and um, cool. that was very exciting. Okay. And we thought, wow, you know, I remember I did some slide on something, and it was one of. Pete Townsend's SG or something that had been glued back together. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, yeah like right, okay. Perfect for slide, you know, and yeah. I, was, I was like, wow, because I was a big Who fan and all that, and I was like, wow, I'm playing. So there was some exciting stuff and bits of connections and one thing or another, and it's a bit like one of these things you think, yeah, the thing's really going to take off. Yeah. We've, oh, got, yeah. we've got a manager, uh, an agent, and so we've got more and more work and all of this, and of course got stitched up by somebody and you know usual nonsense yeah, yeah. and um, it, we ended up just getting disillusioned we were quite green in a business way and we didn't have anybody fighting our corner well enough no. um, to take care of that side of it and no. it just went and we just thought and after we just thought we'd had enough run out of energy yeah, yeah. in terms of the, put all this work into it and it didn't yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. And then we, uh, so then what happened? Yeah, we kind of metamorphosed, we had a lineup change. We'd already had a lineup change on the base department, the one way or the other, because the guy, one of the guys left. Um, and then we formed this sort of another band. By that time, we were more into prog rock. So my brother and I, we got a couple of different musicians. Oh, no, we kept the same bass player, that's right. We got a different drummer. And then. Um, it was a good band, that good like proggy sort of band uh, with some good tunes. I think <laughs> yeah. I'd like to record them sometime. And I remember we, at that time we auditioned for some for a drummer in the old days in the Melody Maker, you know, and all of that. Mm. We put this advert. It was obviously quite a good advert because we got some interest some for from some pretty. Um, top-notch drummers <laughs> one of them was a guy Colin Allen I think his name was it played with Focus on one of their albums oh, all yeah, of this yeah, you know yeah. and another guy Les Binks who played with um, oh, so one of these big rock bands Irish guy and I was by that time well into my Irish orchestra <laughs> I was <laughs> I was loving that and this guy came on the audition yeah and when he, he set up his kit I didn't know anything about this guy except he'd said who some people he played with and so on and I thought he obviously sounds like he'd be good he comes in he sets his kit up and the first thing he just warming up he played one of the drum patterns off the first Malavision Orchestra albums 
you know, like just like Billy Common were playing, and I was like, "What? This guy is well, he's a fantastic drummer." And I thought, "That is the guy we want." And I remember we so we auditioned him, and we thought, "Yeah, he he's perfect." And he said, "Yeah, yeah, I'd be interested to do it." And uh, <laughs> he was saying, um, "I just you know I'd need to obviously paid to be paid for rehearsals." Okay, how much is that? And it was like 20 quid a rehearsal, which at that time for us was like, it was, I don't know what the equivalent is now, it's like 200 quid or something, you know, and it was, you can't, we want this guy, we can't afford him. But, and, and then we didn't even get as far as auditioning some of the other people that were more kind of quite high profile, but we had this guy from, from Yorkshire and he'd come down to London and all that, he was a great drummer. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us. Something happened to him and all that. And then, anyway, so we formed this, like a prog rock band, I suppose you'd call it. Did a few gigs, got stitched up again. And uh, then we got disillusioned with that pretty quickly, which is a shame because it, well, the other thing that put the nail in the coffin of that band was punk arrived. This yes. was 1976. And yes. we played on this gig at City University in London and there was top of the bill was a band or called earthquake or something like that and they had hans zimmer was the keyboard player Love. before he became a composer yeah, yeah. yeah. i found out later and then we were on it and then bottom of the bill was this unknown band sex pistols right. nobody had ever heard of them we hadn't they went on first i think differently of them now because i thought they were a really good band in their own way but at the time i thought what is this it was a university audience and people just they went as soon as they're on this is not trying to say I'm just saying the truth of it they went out of the room they were not interested and I remember that our drummer and the bass player they said I think they've got something I said you are kidding <laughs> a week later or literally all the hype was in all the media with Malcolm McLaren and all that and I thought what and they just, you know. But the point about it was, in the media, while they were uh, kind of like promoting this idea of punk and sex pistols and all that, at the same time, they weren't just doing that. They were anti-propaganda, or whatever the word is, against the music like prog rock that was had become very popular, yeah, and yeah. saying that it was dinosaur music and it was old hat and all this. And it just really, uh, it, anybody that was doing prog rock was seen like oh. old hat because of the media, and um, it was it was really frustrating because yeah. it was a very good band and it was just like I didn't have a chance. That's an interesting story. It's very interesting. Yeah, it just goes to show that really, sometimes I mean. You know, some of the prog rock stuff, when you look back at it, even some of the big, big bands, like Greenslade is a good example of this. Oh, yeah. I saw a clip of Greenslade playing, and I like Greenslade, and I watched yeah. this thing and I thought, actually, that's actually not that good. You know, it, it, I think you sometimes you don't see the... It's like an illusion. Well, most music is an illusion anyway, but you sort of see through it sometimes. But at that point in time, you don't. Yeah. You see what I mean? It's, and so you only need something to go and burst the bubble. Mm. I mean, the good example of this, if you think about the you know, 1980s type poodle hair rock mm. sort of music mm -hmm. stuff, mm -hmm. and you look at the videos and you go, that's insane. Who would ever think that that looks good? You know, it looks yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. But at the time, you didn't think that. Sure. You know? This sort of cavalier type hairdos that everybody mm. had, you know, you know, David Coverdale type thing. And and it sort of sort of cracked up this to be something really amazing. Mm. But when you sort of look at it from a distance you go, it's like flares, you know. You go yeah. like, that's insane. Mm. You know. But at the time it isn't. And I think that that sort of sometimes it's so, a, a good idea can be pushed so far. It's not a good idea anymore. Yeah. And I think a lot of that was what was going on. I'm not, you know, because yeah. I was playing in a broad rock band. Yeah. You know, and the stuff that you were doing was like, in retrospect, there were stories. 
mm. were they? They mm. were sort of musical stories, like myths happening yeah. Yeah. in musical form, in yeah. a way. And you could look at that and go like, yeah, but it doesn't make sense. No, but myths don't make sense. You know, mm. a lot of prog rock music is a bit like, a bit like that, I suppose, in many ways. But yeah, it's an interesting period of time, and it changed so rapidly from that to punk. Yeah. Well, like I say, didn't it? The it reason, was amazing. The reason it changed so quickly is the media. Yeah. You could call it hype. Yeah, it is media hype, like any sort of propaganda or sort of uh, media kind of spin, if you like. Now, somebody could say that that was a good thing. Some people think it was a good thing because it got you know got up itself or whatever the word is you know and, and too complicated blah blah which is a viewpoint mm. i'm not saying it's right or wrong it's just a viewpoint it is yeah it's just and, and, it. and so um i think this but what what i think you can say about it is from from what i saw was you had one part of a form of music that was pr fairly popular with quite mm. a big audience that was kind of dissed and like made to look like it was valueless mm. and in like you say in retrospect somebody could have one viewpoint is certainly some of that music was not of the value that people probably thought at the time mm. some of it probably is like anything um but what i'm trying to say is that that thing that how fast it happened was yeah. purely media it was not because like i say an example of that is the gig I did, Krakatoa, that band was called, that Hans right. Zimmer was in. They were a prog rock band. We were sort of like a proggy band. He had that, and the place was packed with students. Oh, yeah, totally. With students. So totally. they obviously liked that stuff. Yeah. And they went, oh. yeah. That's just some people. So. Yeah. Uh, you know, somebody could look at that, yeah. and they, and if they say, if they put in the media. Yeah some story but they had a journalist and they put in the media what happened at that gig yeah. and blew that thing up yeah. it could look like oh there's this stuff called punk it's crap blah 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 and this prog yeah. rock isn't what people want yeah, you know yeah, what I mean yeah, yeah, yeah. but it was that isn't what happened in the media no, no. No, it's the other and all I'm saying it's a you know a lot of that thing was just the media yeah. now a lot of the punk stuff some of it it's a viewpoint whatever you say because if somebody likes it they like it yeah. But so, somebody could have the viewpoint that a lot of that wasn't very good. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I'm not saying it wasn't very good, I'm just saying they could say that, but they could yeah. say some of it was very good. Yeah. Either way, a lot of people like punk, some people didn't like it. It's like anything. So yeah, a lot yeah. of the thing, I, yeah. it was the first time for me, in terms of the music business, as opposed to music, mm. of the, you know, how things like any product, any anything, propaganda, whatever you call it, media hype, things can be manipulated all the time in the media for whatever reason. I don't mean just music, it's an interesting thing and I'd never seen it like here yeah. in, in a way that affected me sort of personally. <laughs> I took it personally, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But after that, I, you know, I mean, that band, went, that was the end of that. And I ended up, just playing lots of, uh, I used to play seven days a week in local gigs around the Hastings mm. area. And literally one night I'd play with a duo, a jazz duo. Another night I'd play with a folk thing. Mm. Another type I'd play with a rock band. Then I'd play with a sort of like fusion -y trio. And it was like, I'd just do any gig that was there with different people and then all sorts of stuff. <laughs> yeah, <it's laughs> and it was an interesting time. I was learning different stuff. Uh, you know, on the guitar and so on. It was a bit of a weird period yeah. in, in some ways, but I learned a lot. But yeah. um, in terms of a career sort of thing, it, I wouldn't say it was a high point. No. No. <laughs> now, what I, what I think would be a really good thing to do, because I've got my on Tom here. Mm. Um, we've only got to about 1970. 70, no, we haven't ever looked about 1970. Late 70s. Yeah, 6, 7. I reckon we should pursue this as another podcast <laughs> because we've got more to come. Because obviously we've got all the stuff that you do now. Yeah. Um, that was really fascinating. I mean, there's a lot of stuff there which I think r really resonates uh, with people who are certainly people that are involved in music and look back, you know, particularly even the, the, the stuff earlier on we were talking about learning. 
you look at it and go, oh God, yeah, that's so true. And um, so that's that's been really, really good, Tony. So we'll, we'll draw to a close here, but we must continue this. So thanks ever so much. You're welcome. That seems like a good place to stop. And uh, we'll be picking up on that story uh, in a couple of episodes' time. So until next time, all the best. Thank mm-hmm. you.